Thanks for joining us. A de facto town square that is extremely important to the future of civilization. Well, that's how Elon Musk describes Twitter. With this takeover, the social media giant, the billionaire is promising to make it an open platform and to restore banned accounts. Twitter currently censors Republican members of Congress at a rate of 53 to 1 compared to Democrats. It also suspends conservatives 21 times more often than liberals. Many believe that Musk will change all that. Tara Mergener brings us the story. Musk, a self-proclaimed free speech absolutist, has been critical of Twitter's picking and choosing which posts get deleted. His involvement is welcomed by those accusing the platform of censorship while making its defenders uneasy. With around 200 million users worldwide, the deal could reshape social media. Twitter has become kind of the de facto town square. If approved, Musk plans to take the company private. My strong intuitive sense is that uh, having a public platform that is maximally trusted um, and, 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 and broadly inclusive um, is extremely important to the future of civilization. Twitter founder and ex-CEO Jack Dorsey seems happy, writing, taking it back from Wall Street is the correct first step. The platform has been a political battleground for years, accused of taking partisan action against various subjects and discussions, including medical information and even spiritual thoughts. Pastor Dave Scarlett saw his ministry's account banned after this Good Friday tweet showing Jesus was retweeted by rapper MC Hammer to his massive following. It went absolutely viral. And then literally within an hour, they took us down without any reason, any warning, any strikes. We've never been in a timeout or anything like that. And we were just done. Just last week, a new report highlighted more than 600 instances where people who criticized President Biden on Twitter or Facebook had comments deleted or accounts banned. And critics say Twitter goes after Republicans far more than Democrats. Twitter and Facebook censor Republican members of Congress at a rate of 53 to 1 compared to Democrats. Twitter suspends conservatives 21 times more often than liberals. While Musk could reopen the door to President Trump's banned Twitter account, the former commander-in-chief says he won't return. Under his leadership, Musk is promising transparency, a public algorithm, and to restore banned accounts. We don't know why some people are being shadow banned, which is kind of the new term that's been coined lately. And so what Elon wants to do in pursuit of this idea of just kind of this universal good of free speech is to say, we're going to make these things open. We're going to have Twitter be open sourced. While conservatives have been happy with Musk's takeover, many in the establishment media have been highly critical and question Musk's ability to run the company. It is not at all clear here, Stephanie, that you know his incredible uh, popularity on Twitter, right? He has over 80 million followers, in any way qualifies him or prepares him to run the party. Many conservatives blasted Twitter in 2020 for silencing certain political views, including the New York Post's report on Hunter Biden's laptop before the president's election. Skeptics on the left are now threatening to jump ship as Musk prepares to take the helm. He's uh, routinely over the years tried to shut down his critics, uh, silence them. He's used Twitter to savage them. But after Twitter approved his offer, Musk himself tweeted, I hope that even my worst critics remain on Twitter because that is what free speech means. It's expected to take time for changes to begin at Twitter. Musk's purchase still needs to be finalized, which could take several months. In Washington, I'm Tara Mergener, CBN News. I think it's worth pointing out the reaction to this takeover and the contrast in the reaction to Jeff Bezos, another libertarian, taking over the Washington Post. With that takeover, I think the Democrats thought that they were safe, uh, that Bezos wasn't going to change the editorial policy of the Washington Post to somehow be in favor of Republicans. With Twitter, you have the uh, exact opposite, the condemnation of billionaires taking over media companies, taking them private, uh, doing these things. It's somehow it's anti-free speech, and you're hearing 
a lot from the left saying they're going to leave Twitter. Now, there, when, when you look at the past election, I, I think it was quite clear both Facebook and Twitter uh, were on the Democrat side, and, and they seemed to have an editorial policy for that and seemed to want to ban conservative voices. Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could trust platforms and we could trust big tech to say, no, hands off on the politics, we're going to allow free speech, and we're not going to try to censor voices uh, in any political election. That would be wonderful. We don't have that right now. And, and we're seeing uh, conservative viewpoints, divergent viewpoints routinely throttled. Uh, and, and why is that allowed to happen? Now, it, the reason it's allowed is that they're not under the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights only covers the government. So is this something for... Uh, Congress to take a role in, and how do we ensure free speech over these marketplaces? Because they have become the de facto town square. And in that town square concept, you do have the Bill of Rights, because now that's public. Now, will Congress actually say Facebook is a public platform, Twitter is a public pr platform, and will they extend constitutional guarantees uh, that remains to be seen. Do we have the political will to do it? And can we actually get the two parties to agree that we should have open platforms? So I, for one, applaud this. I applaud the sentiment behind it that we need to have town squares where freedom of speech is recognized. All voices are able to have an equal access to that platform because the fundamental of free speech is not censorship. It's in, the comp it's in the competition of ideas that the best ideas always emerge. And in that, you're never afraid of divergent viewpoints, uh, the divergent opinions. Uh, you allow them to freely interact, and you can freely critique them, or you can freely agree with them. Uh, that's the basis of the principle that the Founding Fathers had, and we should follow that in everything we do. In other news, the head of the Department of Homeland Security is facing tough questions from Congress about protecting our southern border. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, Alejandro Mayorkas says the U.S. has effectively managed the border crisis under the Biden administration, but that is not flying with critics. And now both Republicans and Democrats are raising concerns about lifting a policy put in place during the COVID pandemic known as Title 42. That move is expected to lead to a massive surge of illegal immigrants. CBN's Matt Galka brings us that story from Washington. Immigration front and center on Capitol Hill this week with the Secretary of Homeland Security facing three different congressional committees with many members wondering what happens when Title 42 ends. Under this administration, our department has been executing a comprehensive strategy to secure our borders and rebuild our immigration system. Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is facing increasing pressure from Congress while trying to make the case for the department's budget requests. Lawmakers from both sides are concerned that lifting Title 42, a pandemic policy that allowed border agents to turn away migrants, will add to an already surging border problem. Um, I think it's uh, ludicrous that you're saying comprehensive and deliberate strategy since January of 2021, and yet here we are with um, a worsening and compounding crisis at our southern border. I'm appalled by the fact that it has been a year since you sat before us last, and the only change regarding the situation at the southwest border is that the situation has gotten much worse. Some Democrats are demanding a replacement plan as well. And 42 should not be done away with until we get an immigration poly or a policy or until the CDC basically says we do not have a health crisis. And with a health crisis, we can't take any more chance of people coming undocumented and unchecked. Mayorkas acknowledged preparing for another surge if the policy is lifted, with some estimates citing the number at an additional 18,000 people daily. The secretary pointed back to lawmakers. We inherited a broken and dismantled system that is already under strain. It is not built to manage the current levels and types of migratory flows. Only Congress can fix this. 
Mayorkas gets another round of grilling on Thursday from the House Judiciary Committee. Now, this issue is expected to play a major role all year and through the midterm elections, with some Republicans even signaling that they would be in favor of impeaching Mayorkas if they take control of the chamber after November. Matt Gelka, CBN News. Turning now to Russia's war in Ukraine, Vladimir Putin warns there will be lightning-fast retaliation if anyone from outside Ukraine tries to intervene and pose a threat to Russia. Putin avoided any specific mention of nuclear weapons, but his foreign minister said this week the risk of nuclear war is real. In the midst of the tensions over Ukraine, the U.S. and Russia did engage in a prisoner swap Wednesday, exchanging former U.S. Marine Trevor Reed for Russian pilot in jail in the U.S. on drug charges. Despite that positive note, Ukraine said today Russia's offensive in the east has picked up momentum with several towns coming under intense attack. The brutal fighting in Ukraine has led to a flood of refugees in the last two months. One sister who takes care of her younger brother decided they could no longer stay in their home and they fled to Poland, where CBN's Operation Blessing was there to help them. Take a look. As the war raged around them in Ukraine, Anya did her best to take care of her younger brother. But eventually, the violence hit too close to home. The other week, uh, a missile was hit, like, literally in the our house. It was like a massive, huge explosion. And I understood that I uh, take care of my brother. I am responsible for my brother. So I decided it's like the best thing I can do is like to flee to the safest place possible. Sadly, there's no safe, safe places in Ukraine anymore. Anya took her brother and fled to Poland. Thanks to Operation Blessing Partners, Anya and her brother received a meal and a hot drink, a warm place to recover from the cold, and most importantly, the hope to continue. Human kindness is like one of the things that helped me going on. I was like going here without like knowing anything. I literally was going into the nowhere with the little money, with the little clothes and everything I have. And I don't know, I'm, I'm just so amazed by how kind people can be. Operation Blessing took Anya and her brother to a local church partner. There they could safely recover before continuing on their journey. I would just say enormous, a huge thank you. You just... This means so much for every one of us. It comes so deeply from my heart. It's, it's such a gratitude that cannot be expressed by anything. I'm, I'm so thankful. Gratitude for human kindness. So beautiful to see in the midst of tragic times. Gordon? That gratitude goes to you. If you were part of the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund, our efforts are ongoing. We plan to be there for the duration, as long as there's need on that border, as long as the refugees have need. And then uh, hopefully, and I'm praying that the war would end very quickly, um, but it, the rebuilding is going to take years. We want to be there for people in their time of need. If you want to help, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. You can write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Just put Disaster Relief Fund in the memo line of a check. You can text us, OB Crisis, to 71777, or you can go to CBN.com. Either way, do it now. 1-800-700-7000. The longer Russia's war on Ukraine continues, the greater the threat of a myological attack. Here at home, the United States is woefully unprepared to defend itself against germ warfare. What's worse, the COVID pandemic showed our enemies exactly where we're most vulnerable. Caitlin Burke brings us the details. According to the State Department, both Russia and North Korea have active biological weapons programs. Iran and China aren't far behind. Yet here in the U.S., there are serious questions to whether our main system to detect a biological attack even works. So the nation has a national biodetection system called BioWatch, and associated with that is a, um, an acquisition program called BD-21. My understanding is they don't work, period, 
for most of the biological agents for which those systems are supposed to be um, detecting. The Department of Homeland Security launched BioWatch back in 2003, and the technology hasn't been updated since. Dr. Asha George, executive director of the Commission on Biodefense, says it's time for DHS to shut it down. There needs to be some kind of transfer of technology or transfer of mission out of the Department of Homeland Security to somebody else if DHS can't handle it. And if it's a basic science issue, then we need to get the science and technology community, the basic research people back involved to produce something. We recently saw the issues with this detection technology play out when the first U.S. case of COVID-19 was officially confirmed on January 21st, 2020. But studies suggest the virus started circulating here up to a month earlier. We must be prepared for the next inevitable biosecurity crisis. The COVID lessons learned do not teach us the value of preparedness. I do not know what will. Waiting for the next crisis to take action is too late. Experts, including Dr. George, recently testified about biosecurity before the Senate Homeland Security Committee. George pointed out a lack of investment in this area puts the country at an extreme disadvantage. Russia and China are investing billions into their bioeconomy, and part of doing that is investment in uh, protective technologies, vaccines, personal protective equipment, and anything else that will that will uh, bring the economic aspect of biology in the 21st century up to the next level. One response element in desperate need of funding is the strategic national stockpile. The stockpile is postured for a rapid, coordinated response. Originally created to ensure the nation's readiness against agents of bioterrorism like anthrax, SNS has evolved and now also contains stores of vaccines, treatments, and equipment. Yeah, so the strategic national stockpile is kind of like a pantry. And just like you're going to make some something you don't make that often, but you walk into the pantry and you say, oh, here's my sea salt and here's my baker's yeast. Um, you, you go and you pull it off, you use it when you need it. Sticking with that analogy, when we needed the baker's yeast, it had expired. Investment has been sporadic over the years due to a lack of biological threats. Things will get worse than they are right now. Then when COVID hit, supplies were diminished, expired, or the technology was out of date. Senator Bill Cassidy says the SNS needs serious reform, and he believes it can be done in a way that helps to solve the funding problem. I would like it so that it could be cycled out, not wasted, and then replaced on the back end. Because if you're selling something a year before it expires, you've got money to buy something new. Cassidy says the pandemic is now the playbook for biological warfare, which makes learning quickly from our mistakes a matter of national security. We'll never know for sure whether or not that virus started in a Wuhan lab or just spontaneously occurred. But what we do know is that now our enemies know how to do it. You would come up with the designer virus, you would simultaneously come up with a highly effective vaccine. You would give the vaccine to all your people, and then you'd release the virus. Given the COVID wake-up call, the government is moving to address various gaps, including legislation to reform the national stockpile and new investigations by both the intelligence community and the Pentagon, delving into the potential threats we face and where our biodefense currently stands. To have a threat increase without, without significant effort to try and at least prevent it from getting worse only puts us and the rest of the world in a situation where if a biological weapon were to be used, it's going to be that much more catastrophic. We can't have that. In 2015, the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense laid out 33 recommendations to prepare for a large-scale biological event. To date, only three have been fully completed. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. Well, let's get a little history lesson here. Let's go back to the Obama administration. And President Obama said one of the things we have to worry about is pandemics. As uh, civilization goes into places that had never been before, humans hadn't come into contact, you're going to come in contact with viral agents that have the potential to go around the world. Now, that statement is absolutely true. And when you look at Ebola in Africa and the SARS virus in, in China, uh, those are a result of civil, civilization going into places that previously humans hadn't been before. 
and uh, you, you come back with these things that are able to jump from one species to another, and because we had never seen them before, we had no immunity for them. Well, the response, though, didn't work. The response from the Obama administration, and Fauci was part of this, was to fund institutes of viral study in China, of all places. And so that Wuhan Institute that's become so famous actually was started with U.S. tax dollars. And you look at that and go, what in the world were we thinking? Um, and you put money into it, but you don't have the ability to control the environment. You don't have the ability to enforce proper quarantine measures and, and proper viro virology me measures. So you created a lab that when French scientists visited said uh, in a report to our State Department, this is a potential catastrophe. And we ignored that warning. So at the very least, as we're trying to prepare for future pandemics, which may or may not be caused by a hostile government, but just you know the, the mere fact that these viruses have been around for a long time, but haven't been, we, humans haven't been exposed to them. At the very least, can we stop funding studies that you can't control? Can we at least do that? And can we then start funding studies right here where we can control it to come up with how do we quickly get vaccines to market that can stop a pandemic. The, this COVID has proven we are completely defenseless. And uh, you, know, you get all these medical questions and even our medical experts are throwing up their hands saying we really don't know. And we really don't know where the pandemic is going. Well, why don't we get to a point where we could know and we could stop and we could be prepared. In 2021, the Christian music trio Kane earned a Dove Award nomination. They were Best New Artist. Well, the group already has two number one hits. Their songs have been streamed millions of times. And yet, this band almost ended before it began. Just a few years ago, singer Taylor Kane was infected with a virus that nearly stole her voice. And it came very close to taking her life. See my hands and look at my feet It's okay if it's hard to believe Taylor Kane is one of three siblings that make up the popular contemporary Christian music group, Kane. But there was a time when Taylor thought she may never sing again. In 2015, she went on a mission trip to Honduras. The plan was to repair um, things in their villages, just to be around and whatever they needed, that's what we were gonna do. And so we just, we got to sing songs about Jesus. By the time she returned home to Alabama, she began feeling ill. It was alarming how much I was vomiting. Um, I would stand up out of the bed and I knew I had my routine of like, this is, I couldn't keep anything down. Her parents eventually took her to a hospital in Huntsville where doctors tried to diagnose the source of the virus that was now attacking her kidneys and immune system. The ER doctor called my parents back and he was like, okay, here's the deal. So your creatinine level, and they said right now you're at an 8.2 and your kidneys fail after three. It was a condition called acute tubular necrosis, uh, which uh, can cause severe kidney failure. We see it commonly. In her case, I think it was likely caused by severe dehydration. That's when we were just felt devastated that, oh, wow, we are, we're in serious trouble. Taylor's parents, her then boyfriend, Stephen, and her siblings began contacting people to pray. It really grew like wildfire. Thousands and thousands literally around the world were praying for her. There was this cloud hovering over the whole group. We know the God that we sing about. We know the God we hope that comes through, but here we are for the first time, like standing at the edge of the Jordan. There was one night when my family, they were really tough and they, you know, we all kind of had the same like faith, just faith only. And, but then everybody just started to cry. And it, I just was like, what am I missing? Like, am I dying? Is this really happening? They came into the, the room in the middle of the night and they like turned her on her side because her blood pressure had spiked and they were, they kept saying septic, septic. She, I think she's getting septic. I remember leaving and going into the hallway and just crying because it just felt like more bad news. 
Although things did not look hopeful, Taylor's family continued to stand in faith for her healing. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. We just said, this is not what we see, this is what we want. And we want Taylor to be healed, and, and, and uh, not because Taylor's special, but because God wants us all healed. At one point, a nurse began relating the possible outcomes. When you shoot for the most, the most devastating thing, it robs you of your hope. They sent this lady in, bless her heart, to prepare us for a lifetime of dialysis. And I kept trying to tell her, man, we just can't hear this right now. She kept just going with it. No, I think you need to hear this. No, I think you need to Finally, I just said, not another word. Taylor was scheduled for a surgery to install the port for her dialysis. But before they did, they did one more kidney biopsy. Taylor was being prepped for a permanent portal in her neck to have to have chemotherapy and dialysis the rest of her life. And this medicine was going to destroy every dream my girl could possibly have. It was going to make her hair fall out. It was going to make her gain weight, ruin her voice as a singer, and make her sterile so she couldn't have children. Even if I got a transplant, that wouldn't stop the, the autoimmune. My body was attacking my kidneys. Just before she went to surgery, the doctor came in with the results from the biopsy. Mom runs out into the hallway and then she comes back and she's like, he just told me he canceled your surgery. He was like, your kidney biopsy came back completely clean. Your kidneys look, nev they've never been better. And he was like, you're gonna recover on your own. I remember I stood up on my hospital bed with my IV bag, just we were hugging and screaming. It was like just the biggest celebration. You know, it was a real emotional moment for him. Uh, I know there were a lot of people praying for her at the time, and I, th I think those prayers were answered. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can you say In 2020, the group signed a major record deal and have since landed two number one hits and won a Caleb Award for Breakout Single of the Year. She, along with her brother and sister, are singing and ministering around the world. And I'm just so thankful that we had the word in us and we had the prayers of people surrounding us to fight that. To that point, our music career was everything we cared about. And in that moment, we had to, to reprioritize our lives and say like, okay, well, if she cannot, we won't without her, so we won't. Mm, yeah. Because we'd rather have her than whatever comes from music. My spirit is with you. I am beyond thankful that for the last six years, I have been singing nonstop. And what the enemy tried to take from me, it's like it has just rocketed. Prayers work, they work. Ask people to pray for you and like really believe, really believe that anything is possible. But goodbye is not the end. Anything is possible through prayer and with God. And today we just want to honor that truth for you in your life. You know, this is an amazing story of a girl who was near death and at best was going to lose a lot of life for the rest of her natural life. You know, God, God can intervene in the midst of circumstances that seem impossible when we stand on his word and we believe. We want to activate your faith today by sharing some prayer requests. You know, we're in the middle of our week of prayer here, praying for people. There are thousands of requests on the table here in front of us. People have written in saying, please pray for me. Here's one. It's a person saying, desperately need to be healed of AFib, acid reflux, and irritable bowel syndrome. Someone else saying, to ease my loved one's mind and physical pain now that they are under hospice care. And then another, that my prodigal child would come back to the Lord and serve him. Gordon, you have some. I have to be healed of cancer, my jaw, lymph nodes, then to be healed of MS, all the side effects from the medication. And then for my family, that we would be unified. We hardly speak to one another. Let's lift these to the Lord. Let's lift all of the prayer requests that have been written in. Let's lift you to the Lord. In that same verse that that wonderful pastor, is also the father, said, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Start hoping for things. 
Hope for them. Hope. Look to things that give you hope. Look to heaven. When you see heaven, you get a lot of hope. In heaven, there's nobody sick. There's nobody with failing kidneys. There's nobody that has MS. There's nobody that has any disease at all. Look to heaven. And then with that hope, pray, Lord God Almighty, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray that. Let's pray that with all of our hearts, knowing that he wants to answer our prayers, knowing he wants to provide. Let that knowledge give you the hope to believe. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. We come to you believing. And Lord, we just turn now from every negative thought, every negative diagnosis, any negative word that has been spoken up over us, all the well-meaning words designed to uh, get us prepared. We, we turn away from all of that and we look to you and we prepare our hearts for heaven. And we prepare now that the kingdom of heaven is drawing near to us, that your will is drawing near to us. Your every intent towards us is love, restoration, healing, forgiveness. We see you and we see the answer to every one of our needs. So, Lord God, be Emmanuel to us right now. Be God with us, in us, all around us. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this, Lord. Give us this vision that we could see. Open our eyes. Open our ears. Give us a heart of understanding to know the greatness of your power. Now we lift these requests to you and we declare in heaven there's no one with cancer in his jaw. There's no one with MS. There's no one with AFib. There's no one with acid reflux. There are no families that are fighting. Lord, we come to you and ask for miracles. Be with us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Terry Gunn's giving you something. Now, there right now, AFib, not just this person who's written in, but others, God is healing that condition, even though you have had it for a long time, and the likelihood of that happening is practically nil. But God today is doing a miracle for you, setting back in order the rhythm of your heart. It will not go out again. Receive that in Jesus' name. I'm getting a visual picture of someone in a hospital bed, and either you just finished a procedure or you're getting ready for one. Uh, you have the monitors on you. There's uh, one wire that goes down um, to to your stomach with a monitor. There's one that's that's up here, um, and you've got the um, uh, injection site already in your left arm and left hand. God is healing you. He is restoring you right now. As you're listening to me, faith is building within your body. Faith to believe. Jesus is coming to you now with healing. Be healed. Be restored. New energy, new vitality. In Jesus' name, we receive it now. There's someone else. I don't know what the cause of this was, but it's like you're, you are a singer also. It's like your vocal cords have been stripped. And I mean, you can hardly speak, much less sing. God's healing that condition for you. Just lift up your hands. Begin to gently praise the Lord. You're, you're going to be restored completely in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone you've had a concussive injury to your right ear. Um, I don't know exactly what happened, but I just get concussive injury. And what 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 went went on was your eardrum was ruptured, and then things within the ear were damaged, uh, the inner ear. God's restoring you right now. He's restoring your hearing. You're just you're you're going to hear clearly, in Jesus' name. Just receive it now. 
Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you have done, all that you are, and all that you are preparing for us. We thank you for everything that you do because love is motivating all of it. You love us so tenderly and so dearly. We thank you. We thank you. Now be with us. Encourage us in the midst of the years. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. All you have to do is call us and say, this is what God did for me. 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. And we're here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We believe in prevailing prayer. That's the prayer that doesn't give up, that says, I'm going to press in until I get my miracle. If you want us to stand in prayer for you, just call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, at noon Eastern, all this week long, we're going to be praying for the prayer requests that you've sent in. I mentioned the thousands sitting before us. We want to invite you to join us during our live stream of these services at cbn.com slash week of prayer. You know, many of you have received this mailer, but if you haven't yet, you can still send us your prayer requests by calling 1-800-700-7000, or you can give us your prayer requests at cbn.com, and you can always write to us at CBN's Week of Prayer, CBN Center, that's Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463, and we'll send you the free prayer brochure that is enclosed, as well as the table prayer, the scripture card. We want you to have these and know that we're praying for you regularly. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. President Biden is reportedly getting closer to taking action on student debt forgiveness. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he believes the president is moving in that direction, but Republicans oppose the idea, with Utah Senator Mitt Romney calling it a bribe for voters and tweeting, other bribe suggestions, forgive auto loans, forgive credit card debt, forgive mortgages. Promise Keepers will host an online event this evening to take on the issue of pornography and provide healing for men suffering from its effects. It is called the Free Man Challenge. Promise Keepers president and CEO Ken Harrison gave CBN News a preview. We ask really tough questions. How do I deal with same-sex attraction? What do I do if my child says they're transgender? All the way up to what do I do about lust problem and how do I communicate that to my wife? So in the hour long program, we deal with these in, in pithy short issues that are really tight. You can watch it this evening from eight to nine and then again from 11 to midnight Eastern on the CBN News Channel. We're also streaming it on our Facebook and YouTube pages. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website, cbnnews.com. Well, today Israel is marking Holocaust Remembrance Day. Branya says her memories of the Holocaust still hang over her head like a black cloud. And recently, when she was locked down because of COVID, those memories rose up with a vengeance. Branya is a Holocaust survivor who lives in Israel. She still suffers daily from the trauma she experienced during the war. I remember when the Nazi arrived at our house and they took my father to the center of the village with the other men. They shot him right there. I never really got to know him. Nazis forced the rest of Branya's family to live in a pigsty during their first winter in the Ukrainian ghetto. We were so cold and hungry. My baby sister starved to death. To this day, I constantly struggle with those memories, like a black cloud over my head. The loneliness brought on by the COVID-19 lockdowns in Israel made her feel even worse. Being alone, worried about the virus has been very hard. Branya wasn't able to go out to get groceries or see her friends because of the threat of catching the coronavirus. So CBN Israel started delivering food and checking in on her to help her feel less lonely. It's wonderful that you want to come see me and bring this food. You make me feel like I still matter to someone. And that means everything. 
Thanks to CBN donors, Branya and other Holocaust survivors in Israel will get the food and support they need during and after this pandemic. And that helps give them peace of mind. Thank you very much for your love. It makes me feel alive. That thank you for your love goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. When you become a member, you're part of everything we're doing around the world, whether that's Operation Blessing or CBN Israel or Orphan's Promise or Superbook or this broadcast. You're a part of all of it. You're supporting all of it. How much is it to be a 700 Club member? Well, it's just $20 a month. That adds up to 65 cents a day. You can join at higher levels, and some of you can do that. So 700 Club Gold is there for you at $40, $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $84 a month. At whatever level, do it now and be a part of it and say, yes, I want to help people. And if you want to designate your gift to CBN is Israel, well, that's real easy, too. All you have to do is say, I want to give to CBN Israel. There's a place on the giving page where you can designate, and you can even do that monthly if you'd like. Uh, you can also write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Either way, do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Well, in all the years of biblical archaeology, not one thing has been discovered that disproves the Bible. You can learn how archaeology actually supports the accuracy of the Bible in CBN Films' new documentary, Written in Stone, Kings and Prophets. For a gift of any dollar amount, we'll send you this all-new DVD. You'll also get exclusive instant streaming access in 4K on the CBN Family app. To get it, all you have to do is go to cbn.com slash written in stone, or you can call us 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want written in stone, kings and prophets. Here's my gift of any dollar amount. Ready for some email? I don't know. I've heard the tease on the first question, and, and I want all the comments to go to you. <laughs> Not a prayer. Send those to Gordon. <laughs> but here it is. This is Patricia who says... You're going to get me in the deep. You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> I've been told the scriptures about women not <laughs> teaching men in the Bible was a custom of that time and does not apply today. What's your view on women being ordained pastors and evangelists who are teaching men and women? All right, well, let's look at what the Apostle Paul said, and, and specifically, I think it's one of the uh, chapters that gets kind of ignored in this controversy. So it's from Romans chapter 16. And I'll, I'll read from the New Living Translation. So this is verses 1 and 2. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who's a deacon in the church. Welcome her in the Lord as one who is worthy of honor among God's people. Help her in whatever she needs, for she has been helpful to many and especially to me. So if Phoebe, a woman, can be a minister to the Apostle Paul... Well, then I, I kind of go, well, what's the problem? You look at the Greek manuscript, and this is something I got 25 years ago. And um, Dad gave me a, a Greek New Testament. Uh, 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 and in the original manuscript, it, uh, Phoebe's on there as, as a, a writer. Uh, uh, there's a scribe specifically listed in the text, but in the postscript it talks about Phoebe. So not only was she the one carrying the letter to the Church of Rome, Rome, Rome which means she would have been the one to read the letter to the Church in Rome, but she was also part of the creation of the book, which I find incredible. Here's another example from the same uh, chapter, chapter 16, verse 3. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. So there you have a husband and a wife, and Priscilla is listed first. And they, again, co-workers. Here's one that you may not have heard about, and it's from the seventh verse of the same chapter. Uh, and it, so, so Paul is literally talking about his entire ministry team. And so this is uh, from the, the seventh verse of the 16th chapter. Greet Andronicus and Junia. Junia is a woman's name. My fellow Jews who were in prison with me, they are highly respected among the apostles and became followers of Christ before I did. So the apostle Paul is calling Junia an apostle. 
So if that happened in the first century, well, then why can't it happen in the 21st century? Uh, so that's my take on it. I do have a thing about discipling uh, where I think it's better for men to be discipled by men. I think it's better for women to be discipled by women. Uh, you need to get into areas of life that it's probably not good uh, for that to cross um, into a member of the opposite sex. Uh, but in terms of women having freedom in the church, uh, Paul gave it to them, uh, which means he didn't do it. Jesus did it. And so if, if Jesus did it, then it's why not good us? Good with me. <laughs> and Terry's a prime example. That's right. Who has ministered to me, <laughs> and including to me. on this very show. <laughs> There's this Thane who says, Hi, I've been going through a long depression and have been on antidepressants mm. from time to time. Not sure why they're not helping me this time. I'm really tired and fatigued a lot, wondering if God doesn't want me taking meds. Uh, boy, I've got a few seconds to answer a very complicated question. I'm not going to interfere with what your doctor has prescribed for you. I will tell you being tired and fatigued is a prime sign of chronic depression. Uh, do whatever it takes to get free from that, don't vary your doctor's instructions. We leave you with these words from John. We are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. God bless, we'll see you tomorrow.